The BVM, or bag valve mask, is a tool most emergency or critical care clinicians don't utilize daily, but it plays an essential role in the management of many emergencies and procedures we partake in on a semi-regular basis. In the next few minutes, I would like to give you some brain food regarding ways to improve your BVM technique. Although not everyone will buy into this, there is some importance to understanding the basic parts of a bag valve mask. Here, we see a relatively traditional BVM. It consists of multiple important parts for the provider to be aware of and becomes even more versatile with added equipment. In order to put all the pieces together, we must have a basic understanding of the primary components of a bag valve mask as well as a couple accessories not often utilized. A self-inflating bag. This part of the BVM is probably the most self-explanatory. After being squeezed, it reinflates itself. Another thing to be aware of is that many self-inflating bags contain approximately 1200 mLs of air, plus or minus about 200. This is very important, especially when you find out that the average adult tidal volume is approximately 300 to 500 mLs. And just think about that the next time you see someone double fisting the entire bag while ventilating a patient. Then there's the face mask, another absolutely essential portion of the BVM. This should have air within the portion of the mask that we placed against the patient's face. Some BVM masks have a reservoir to put air into the mask if it has deflated. A pop-off valve is another component of a BVM but is not found on all models. A pop-off valve is more often found in pediatric and neonate variations of the device. A pop-off valve, often referred to as a pressure relief valve, serves the purpose of preventing over pressurization of the lungs. Many pop-off valves pop off at approximately 40 centimeters of water. The exhalation port, often accompanied by a flow diverting cap, is where air is, well, where air is exhaled. Knowing where the exhalation port is located and how it functions is important. Why? Because it is where the peep valve will be inserted. The peep valve is an underutilized tool that can be added to a BVM providing positive end expiratory pressure or PEEP. Able to be adjusted from 5 to 20 centimeters of water, not only does this accessory assist with oxygenation, but prevents absorptive atelectasis and can be utilized for pre-oxygenation and nitrogen washout when utilized prior to RSI. End tidal CO2, and yes, this is the same T-piece we use for confirmation of endotracheal tube placement after intubation. This is another underutilized piece of equipment that can be used to determine the effectiveness of your ventilation and ventilation technique. It is attached between the bag valve mask, mask and the exhalation port. When attached to an appropriate monitoring device, a breath rate can be readily identified breath by breath. Trending of the end tidal CO2 levels can also be performed and titrated to the desired CO2 levels. When a PEEP valve and an end tidal CO2 T-piece are added to BVM, more effective ventilation and oxygenation can occur and be more easily monitored. Don't forget about the oxygen inlet and the reservoir bag. I won't go into depth here, just add O2. Now a quick overview of a PEEP valve. The PEEP valve provides positive end excitatory pressure or PEEP as mentioned earlier. A PEEP valve does exactly what you think it does. It provides positive pressure at the end of expiration. With the application of a PEEP valve to a BVM, that positive pressure at the end of exhalation can assist with opening the alveoli and also improves ventilation perfusion mismatch, shunt, atelectasis, and atelectasis trauma, all while maintaining alveolar recruitment. Now, I have heard and read some contradicting information on what PEEP actually does. What we do know for sure is that after a breath is delivered, it maintains that alveoli in an open state at the end of expiration, essentially holding the alveoli open, not allowing them to close. This in increases or restores the functional residual capacity. The functional residual capacity, or FRC for those who aren't familiar, is the amount of air that remains in the lungs after normal exhalation. This is where the magic of oxygenation tends to happen. What some seem to disagree on is whether PEEP assists with recruiting the alveoli or not. I don't know the answer to this as I've read contradicting information from what I would refer to as reputable sources. The theory I'm sticking with is that alveolar recruitment comes from tidal volumes delivered from a BVM or ventilator and that the PEEP maintains the recruitment obtained from the delivered tidal volumes. That was a very long spiel just to say PEEP maintains recruitment of the alveoli which will lead to increased and improved oxygenation because there are more alveoli to participate in the O2 CO2 gas exchange. Use a PEEP valve whenever possible. Now, is there a downside to PEEP? Yes, PEEP can cause a decrease in venous return to the heart resulting in decreased cardiac output. A provider using 
a PEEP valve on a hypotensive patient should consider using lower settings with the PEEP valve device. There is also an increased risk of barotrauma while utilizing PEEP, especially in the patient population with sick and fragile lungs. But with appropriate ventilation and technique, this shouldn't be a large issue we should consume ourselves with. I always seem to get the same questions regarding the entitled CO2 T-piece when adding it to a BVM. Who should we use an entitled CO2 device on? An entitled CO2 T-piece should be used on all patients who are obtundent or have respiratory distress, whether it's done by nasal cannula type device or an inline device. It is an essential tool to be utilized every time you choose to ventilate a patient via BVM. Why use the inline entitled CO2 T-piece? It is an invaluable tool for monitoring respiratory ventilation status. An inline end tidal CO2 T piece can be placed between the mask and the BVM exhalation port in the same way it would be placed on an endotracheal tube. While maintaining a good mask seal, a waveform on your cabinogram can be appreciated and used to help guide your ventilation. A poor waveform could be an indication of poor mask seal or lack of air movement in and out. Adjustments to your BVM technique should occur if poor waveforms during ventilation are identified. Is there ever a time when we shouldn't use it? The answer to that is no. Or, well, sure, if you don't want direct feedback on the adequacy of your BVM technique and continued patient condition breath by breath. Here is another variation of the previously mentioned BVM setup. Note, this variation of the device lacks a pop-off valve but has a pressure monitor in place of it. A pressure monitor is valuable and can assist the provider in delivering the breath to maintain appropriate breaths within the normal pressure range. According to many sources, there is this thing called a gastric sphincter opening pressure. This is a pressure at which the gastric sphincter leading to the stomach opens and air is pushed into the stomach, increasing the risk of aspiration. This opening pressure is approximately 20 to 25 centimeters of water. Out with the old and in with the new, as long as you have enough providers. Two person thumbs up bagging versus the traditional C and E technique. The two thumbs up technique, according to research, many online resources and expert opinion has proven superior to the old standard or the C and E technique. Now, I know there are many out there that will argue that the C and E technique isn't ineffective, which is true, but the two thumbs up technique is far more effective at ventilating and oxygenating our patients. What is the downfall? You have to have two providers to perform this skill effectively, which isn't always practical or possible. The optimal way to perform BVM ventilation is with two providers. A mask seal is held with both hands by one provider while the other provider squeezes the bag. When maintaining a mask seal with two hands, a double C and E grip can be used, but the two thumbs up technique is preferred and reportedly more effective. This technique allows both hands to be used for displacing the jaw forward and results in significantly improved mask seal. Maintaining a jaw thrust is also essential in order to maximize oxygenation and ventilation of your patient, otherwise the airway can obstruct and prevent air and oxygen passage. If you have any doubts about the effectiveness of this technique, try it on your next RSI. Your practice will be forever changed, I promise. Now that we're familiar with the two-person thumbs up technique, let's talk about how hard we should squeeze the bag. We know that one provider will be maintaining a very effective mask seal and providing a jaw thrust for increased ventilation, but what is the other provider's job? I spoke earlier about the approximate volume contained within a BVM and how it's oftentimes more than double the needed tidal volume for an adult patient. What this means is that we don't need to squeeze the entire bag. In fact, we honestly don't need to be utilizing two hands. One hand is plenty sufficient. The bag should be squeezed just enough to cause visual chest rise and fall, as well as producing end tidal CO2 waveform return. Be mindful of how fast and hard the bag is squeezed and, if a pressure monitor is present, attempts to not exceed the gastric sphincter opening pressure should be made. The two thumbs up technique in most scenarios should be more than sufficient to ventilate and oxygenate our patients effectively. However, patients with large tongues and, how do I say this, floppy airway tissues may need more than just the standard two thumbs up technique. Adding airway adjuncts such as OPAs and NPAs, and yes, I do mean both, can increase the effectiveness in ventilation being delivered. Keep in mind, if the patient has an intact gag reflex or maxillofacial trauma, the OPA or NPA may be contraindicated. And the last thing I have for you is this fun fact. 50% of volume is lost when laying the patient flat. To effectively recruit alveoli and ventilate appropriately, a heads-up position should be utilized.